Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, <clears throat> excuse me, I, uh, I'm going to begin reading at verse 8 again, and uh, the King James Version of the Bible uses the word charity on occasion to describe the word which is almost always translated love in, in modern times, and as a consequence, I'm going to change it to love as I read it, simply because we tend to mean something very different when we use the word charity these days. Verse 8 begins, Love never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know, or then shall I know, even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Now last week we set out to look at these three important words in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, faith, hope, and love. And what their relationship to us here, not just as as a theological concept or even as a biblical instruction, but in terms of how they relate to our corporate calling and our corporate culture as we stand together serving God and working towards his leading in this place. Amen. And specifically, I was focusing on... uh, Verse 12, where he says, now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, now I know in part. Both of the the word now, translated now there in verse 12, both times is the same word. The word translated now in verse 13 is a different word. And the uh, the one in, in verse 12 is describing a point in time, somewhere on a timeline. It's talking about right now, just now, in this moment. It's saying that in this time, We see through a glass darkly. We don't have a clear view of everything. We've had some things revealed to us, but even the things we've had revealed to us, we don't see as clearly as we shall see them. And a lot of us think we know something. I won't ask you to raise your hand if you think you know something, but we think we know some things. We think we've heard some things. We think we've received some things. We think we've studied a little bit and the Spirit's spoken to us. We've got fast hold of some things. But the fact is, nothing we have a hold of is as clear as it's going to be. And nothing is in as sharp a focus as it's going to be. There's coming a time when there's going to be absolutely no doubt, no shadow, no fuzzy edges to anything that we're dealing with. And that's what he's talking about. He's talking about a transition in time from the moment we're in where we have to perceive things with a a little bit of a filter to a time when we shall know as we are known. And I have to say very, I know there's a lot of disagreements among some scholars about what time we're referring to here, but it seems to me that it would be hard to fix your, any point in history between the cross and now when you could say, we know as we are known. I think that's something we're waiting for, not something which came and went long ago. I don't think there's a moment you can say, well, that was it right there. That's what it was talking about. Now, after that, we're in something different. No, I think we're all still waiting for a time when we shall know even as we are known. We may have a clearer picture of some things than than what some folks have in the past, but we certainly do not know as we are known. So I'm looking for verse 12 to happen someday. But that's important in this sense, because when he says, now abideth faith, hope, and love, The point isn't that that we need these things until that day which occurred, of course, in 121 A.D. No, we need them now because they've got eternity in them because they've got lasting power. Now abide. Abideth means to stay. These things last. These things have power. These things will go. There's an awful lot that seems important to us right now that isn't going to be anywhere near this important at some point. But what we believe... And what we anticipate and what we commit to is important forever. What we believe and what we anticipate and what we commit to is important forever. 
And these things have lasting power. And because of that lasting power, it's important that we understand something about how we are exercised in these areas. Is that coming through a little bit? Now, we visited a lot of things concerning faith last week, and I don't want to revisit all of them. But I did want to remind you briefly that in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, gives us our description of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's what faith does. It lets me gain a grip on things that don't occur to my senses. It gives me a handle on things that I can't touch and taste and see and hear. And without faith, therefore, I would, I would be missing a good deal of what's going on, driving without your headlights on. Hebrews 11.6 also tells us that without faith it's impossible to please God. And it doesn't say it's unlikely, hard, difficult, rare. It says it's impossible. It's not empowered to happen. It isn't enabled. It doesn't work. We can't please God without faith. But the important realization there is that faith is a gift of God. It's a, Ephesians 2.8 tells us that it's a gift of the Father. And Hebrews 12.2 tells us that Jesus Christ is the author and the finisher of faith. It begins with him and then he works it towards maturity. Galatians 5.22 tells us that it's the fruit of the Spirit. And the Spirit, as he works in us, faith is brought forth. But Romans 10.17 tells us the mechanism that God has ordained. And you could say, why has he ordained that? I don't know. There's a good deal written about it, Old and New Testament alike, and it looks like a lot of people don't understand why has he ordained it this way. But he has, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by his word. It's probably some simpler method that we could think of. You think, wouldn't it be nice if faith came by eating chocolate bars? Yeah, that would work. I don't think we'd have any trouble helping people come to faith if faith came by eating chocolate bars. But... That isn't the method. And there's a lot of things which seem to make sense to us and that we would have liked better, but then we're not God and we didn't get to make the choices. And he said, faith comes by hearing and hearing by his word. And so this is, this is uh, the, the way that God, who is the author of faith, has determined for faith to come. Now that is important. And that because faith is the entry point, because without it it's impossible to please God, because it's the way that we perceive things that we don't have a connection with through our senses, it's critical to our connection to salvation. Salvation is by faith. But it doesn't end with salvation because the just shall live by faith. And so we don't get to put down faith and move on in the way that, and I think I probably used the analogy last week of these modern video game kind of things where there's certain tools that you need at certain points in the game and then you leave them behind because you have used the key or the saw or the whatever you're carrying and you don't need it anymore. Or in fact, you don't often even have to leave it behind because once you use it, it just kind of evaporates and it's gone and now you don't have it anymore. Well, Faith isn't like that. It isn't the magic key that gets us into salvation and then we go on beyond that doing other things. We're going to have to keep on believing. And what we believe not only matters as we come to Christ, but as we grow in Christ and as we live in Christ and when ultimately we see him face to face. What we believe is going to be of importance and significance. Is that coming through? Now we step beyond that to talk briefly about hope. And hope is a powerful word. It's uh, frequently misunderstood in our modern context because we have come to use hope to mean a lot of things other than what it means in a biblical sense. But the word in the Bible that we translate hope, elpis in the Greek, means favorable and confident expectation, a forward look with assurance. I believe that's W.E. Vine who said it that way, that it's a Favorable and confident expectation, a forward look with assurance. It deals with the unseen and the future. It is an anticipation of good. You might want to consider it as sort of the opposite of dread or positive dread. Dread is when I look forward to something which hasn't happened, but I'm not pleased with it, and I don't want it to happen. Hope is when I look forward to something that hasn't happened and I am pleased with it and I do want it to happen. Right? Hope. 
Hope isn't just a wish. Hope isn't a kind of a, yeah, sometimes I look at the stars in the sky and I think, wouldn't it be neat if? Hope is stronger than that. Hope is an anticipation, an expectation. And that changes how you live. What you're anticipating, what you're expecting affects everything you do. Let me say that again. What you're anticipating, what you're expecting affects everything you do. You can recognize people who have hope because they act like it. It affects everything they do. When, when I was a kid, I wanted to be an NBA player. Specifically, I wanted to be a power forward. That's a term you don't hear used much anymore, but when I was a boy, that was the way we described one of the five positions out there. Generally speaking, a power forward was somebody who was about six feet, eight inches tall and went about 240 or 50 pounds. I missed that. Charles Barkley was closer to my height but farther from my weight. And he he sort of played the position. But, you know, there's just... there, There came a moment, but at any rate... You say, well, how long did you hang on to that dream? Well, let me tell you how long I held on to that dream. A little. But let me, there's a point to this that we're coming to. But I would read stories of people who grew late. Now, for the most part, I grew early. I was one of those kids who was as tall as he was ever going to be by the time he turned 15. But I'd read these stories about well-known basketball players who graduated from high school looking pretty ordinary and suddenly grew six inches in college. And I'd think... Hmm, it happens. <laughs> and I would think, maybe, just maybe, this is going to be what's happening for me. And my parents would be like, no. And it's like, come on, guys, get with the program. But, uh, but the point is this. If you wanted to know whether that was something that I hoped for in a biblical sense or just something that I showed a little interest in at some point, If you'd have watched me, you'd have seen the answer. I was serious enough about basketball that I played a lot in my driveway after school, that I played every chance I could get somebody else to play with. But I wasn't serious enough about basketball to work at it. I worked at being cool and doing things that impressed other people. I didn't do suicide drills. I didn't run the stairs at the stadium. I wasn't doing miles on the road to increase my wind. I didn't act like somebody who wants to play in the NBA. I acted like somebody who, if the NBA came looking for me, I would say yes. And there's a difference. Are you out there somewhere? A lot of things that people say they hope for, you can tell they don't because they're doing absolutely nothing that a person who was actually anticipating that, expecting it, would be doing. And there's a danger when, as believers, we start to assign that value to a bunch of the things that the Scriptures declare are going to happen. Things that we're called to hope for. We say, oh, I do, I hope. Yes, that's that's one of my hopes. I have that right on, oh, it's a nifty wooden plaque in our dining room. It's got a little pear carved in each corner. It's awesome. And uh, yes, that particular hope is right there. And it's like, yeah, but does your life in any way suggest that you are anticipating or expecting that that's going to happen? Well, I'd like to think so in some way. Well, you know, there ought to be some sense. If we are actually anticipating something, if we are expecting something, you ever seen a little kid expecting something? Man, they, they, they act like they really believe, don't they? I mean, they get serious about this stuff. I can remember some of my early Boy Scout camping trips. I was packing two weeks in advance, getting my stuff. I had my compass. I was ready, man, for an adventure in the woods. My compass, my canteen, my little aluminum mess kit. I had all this stuff that I was never going to use. But it was all there because... Man, you got to be ready. I had special water purification tablets in case we didn't have any clean water and we had to do something with some. We had it all, man. We were ready because we were going to go camping. 
I didn't act like somebody who would go camping if you pulled up and said, let's go, and I'd say, just a minute, I got some stuff. No, I acted like somebody who was planning to go because I'm packing for this trip. I'm living like it every day. I'm talking about it every time somebody's talking to me because we've got one scheduled. It's on the calendar, and it's coming. And I didn't pack my pack the night before we left. My pack sat packed in my bedroom for a week before we left because I was ready to go. You know what I'm talking about? And the things that we say that are our hopes in Christ, the question would be, do we live like we really anticipate them, like we expect them, or are we in fact just kind of casually running along thinking it would be nice if, but it would be okay if not? I suppose that would be cool. I kind of wish that would happen, but, you know, if things just continued as they are, that wouldn't be so bad. Where are we on that scale? And so, um, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 6 here briefly. In the sixth chapter of Hebrews, a verse we hear a lot about, it's verse 19, which says, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Now, there is a context to this, and the context is important. He's brought up the subject of Abraham, because he's brought up the subject of Abraham's blessing has come up, and then having mentioned Abraham's blessing, it becomes important to talk about Abraham and what a type he is for us of what we're supposed to be like and how he responds. And God's statements to Abraham are what are being addressed here. It says... uh, At verse 13, for when God had made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater. Okay. I'll start verse 16 again. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Now that's where this begins to to, uh, get serious for us. It says, God swore by two immutable things, two unchangeable things, because in which it was impossible for God to lie. His authority and his integrity were on the line. He doesn't get to be who or what he is if he isn't true in what he says concerning this. It becomes critical. But he does it that we might have a strong consolation so that we might have something to stand on, something to get hold of, something to encourage and stir us up, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. There's an expectation, an anticipation that He wants to birth in us by His Spirit that we are called to flee to the way you flee to a refuge. You've seen an old movie where there's like air raid siren goes off and the people scatter, headed for the shelters. They're not strolling to the shelter. They're not wondering where there might be a shelter. They're running for the shelters with everything they've got because there is a siren, there is an alarm, and they need to get there because something is going to happen. And it has brought them to a refuge. That type of that, that's both a picture of the anticipation that we need to have, the certainty that something is going to happen, and what is meant by refuge. We need refuge. We're not talking about it's raining, so I may just step under this overhang and seek refuge. We're talking about refuge to be rescued from harm. We have come to this hope because we have a passionate desire and need to lay hold of this thing. It isn't just one of several cool things that I'm interested in. It's something which I need. I need to get a hold of. The things which God has put before us to anticipate. And I'm not talking about things like, uh, you know, 
material things that we might be interested in here and now. I'm talking about these great promises that have been put before us, like just the one we were looking at, that I shall know as I have been known. That's not something to think, that'd be cool. No, no, don't go, that would be cool. Let's go, I anticipate that, and I'm beginning to live like I'm going to know the way that I am known. In the same way that he knows me, intimately and thoroughly, I'm going to know him intimately and thoroughly. And I want to live my life like somebody who expects to know him intimately and thoroughly. And I don't want to presume that the level that I know him at now is sufficient. He's not just the big guy upstairs. There's a lot more to this than that. And we need to have a a different picture of where we're going with this thing. Is that making some sense to you? So we've, we've fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Now that's a powerful statement. He says this hope can anchor your soul. The function of an anchor is to hold a boat so that it doesn't drift away. Certainly when there is a a storm of some sort, you want those anchors to hold. I've been at at all kinds of different docks watching boats when when there's waves and wind and they're bouncing this way and that, but they are anchored. Many of them are tied to the docks, but they're out there. They're anchored in this little marina or whatever we're looking at here, this little bay, this little cove, this little deal. They're anchored, and because of that, though they may dance on the waves, they're not going anywhere, and they'll be here when you come out tomorrow. And I don't know about you, my soul needs anchoring sometimes. The waves get choppy in my world, and my soul wants to run off somewhere and end up at the far end of the lake. And I need to have my anchor down. And I don't like the way that I bounce when my anchor's down, but I like it better than finding myself at the far end of the lake. I'd just as soon it was always calm out here. If it was up to me, perhaps it would always be calm out here. But it hasn't been left up to me, and so I have to deal with this stuff as it comes. But I've got an anchor. And when I found out I've got an anchor that holds me so that I don't just drift off every time something happens. But the anchor is just as important. As much as we talk about the anchor and its relationship to storms and how important that is, you can't just park a boat and walk away. They drift. I've been at camp when we parked canoes by just beaching them, but then we're too lazy to get out and drag them up the beach the way you're supposed to, and just a little bit of tiny bit of waves that you get on a pond or a lake was enough to kind of work the canoe loose and it starts to float away. Am I the only one that's ever seen that? I got some grins out there that suggest I'm not the only one. You learn to drag your canoe up the beach after that, but because it's a lot of swimming to go catch up to a boat and bring it back. But the point there, folks, is this. Calm is also dangerous if you don't have your anchor down because you drift. It doesn't look like you're doing anything or going anywhere, but you're drifting. You're not where you were supposed to be, and you're very slowly moving away from where you're supposed to be, and by the time we notice that you're not where you're supposed to be, it's going to be a problem. It isn't going to be a quick, easy realignment. It's going to be a difficulty, and there's going to be a rescue involved, and there's going to be a problem with this. And so that anchor becomes critical. And what anchors us? Our anticipation, our expectation, what we have to look forward to is what holds us in the storm and keeps us from drifting in the calm. Is that coming through? But it does even more than that. He calls it both sure and steadfast. It's a potent anchor. It's a heavy anchor. It gets the job done which entereth into that within the veil. It's an anchor which goes into the holiest. It's an anchor which won't let you go. It's a hope which cuts all the way through to the presence of God. My anticipation, my expectation goes all the way into the very presence of the living God. Is that an exciting thought? I don't know about you, that excites me. The presence of the living God. I enjoy God's presence and participation in my life 
but I can hardly wait for the time when I can see him and know him as he knows me. When I can experience his presence in that way. I enjoy what we've got going now, but not so much that I want to park here. I find a lot to rejoice about in this current situation, but I've got a future situation which keeps me moving toward it. Because it's just that good. Amen? And that's one of the things that we have to recognize about hope, is that it has the power to hold us in storms, the power to keep us on course in calms, and the power to lead us all the way to the presence of God. Hope is powerful. Hope is necessary. Now, now let's do this. Okay. Let's, uh, let's go to 1 John chapter 3. A familiar verse concerning hope over here. Where he says to us, let's, uh, let's begin at verse 1 where he says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. What hope is he referring to in verse 3? Well, I'm going to say that the hope he's referring to is the action of verse 2, that we sh- when he appears, we shall be like him. That instead of melting away from his presence, instead of being consumed by his presence, instead of failing in his presence, instead of becoming a tiny speck of dust flying off into the far corners of the universe in his presence, that I shall behold him and be like him. That's a remarkable privilege. It's a remarkable turn of events. It's a remarkable thing to ponder. How in the world is that going to happen? But by what he has accomplished through the blood of Jesus and the regeneration of the Holy Spirit, I will be able to behold him and be like him. That's something else. But he says, if you have this hope, if you really do believe that, if you anticipate it and expect it and look forward to it, it's going to show up in the way that you live. Now, I said that a few moments ago, but this is, this, we're here because I said it, and now we've seen it said in Scripture. He says, if you have this hope, you purify yourself. Now, in this case, we're talking about a specific action connected to a specific hope, but the more general principle that I'm pointing to is that what you anticipate determines how you live, the choices that you make. What you're expecting, what you're anticipating, what you're looking forward to is going to determine the way that you handle what you encounter in life. It's going to determine what you do with the hours of your day. It's going to determine how you approach all kinds of things. It's going to determine how you treat people. It's going to determine, you know, you you ever found it difficult to pray, difficult to read your Bible? That's connected to what you're expecting and anticipating. These are not hard things when you're expecting and anticipating the right things. It got quiet out here. This is not nearly as hard a work as sometimes we make it out to be when we have the right expectation and anticipation. If our hope is right, our actions get right. And what we're anticipating is going to affect the way we live. If we really believe that well done, thou good and faithful servant is an available option, it's going to affect the way we live. If that's something we hope for, it's going to affect everything about today. It's going to change things for us. Hope has that kind of power. Now, having said that, we got one more stop here, but before I go there, let me connect this to our corporate activities, our collective, us p- together. We were saying that faith is obviously, since it's the beginning place with God, it's the beginning place for everybody that we know who needs to make a beginning with God. And then because the just shall live by faith, it becomes a method of, of walking along with him as well. And so we work intentionally to be available to 
to uh, foster an environment where faith can be birthed, to present the word so that the word can be received and faith can be a, a product of that. But what does this hope thing have to do with anything? And it basically boils down very simply to this. It's, it's discipleship. The reason that we grow in Christ is because we have a hope. The reason that we pursue anything in Christ is because we have a hope. If we have no expectation and no anticipation, then this is good enough. I don't have any need to change. I like me just the way I am. Heaven someday works for me. Don't mess with me. Are you guys out there? But if I have an anticipation, if I have an expectation of these things, that's going to change everything. That's going to move me to want to grow, to want to change. When Jesus said, the truth shall make you free, we quote just that part. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. That's not what he said. He didn't just say that one day out of the blue like, hey boys, I thought of something interesting this morning. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Put that on a plaque. Put it in your dining room. It's awesome. He said specifically to people who had begun to believe that if you continue in my word, if you abide in my word, if you dwell in and stay in my word, then shall you be my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. There was a couple of things that needed to happen before we ever got to the and you shall know the truth. The, the point isn't that people, people's ignorance of the truth isn't because they've never heard the truth. It's because we haven't done some things to receive the truth. And Everything that causes us to be disciples, everything that causes us to grow in Christ, everything that keeps us moving forward is connected to the question of what are we expecting and anticipating. And if we don't have God-birthed expectations and anticipations in us, then we have very small dreams and very small motivation. But when we have God-birthed expectation and anticipation in us, when it's the expectation, anticipation, when it's the hope that God has given us, it is sufficient, it is steadfast and sure and sufficient to carry us all the way to its realization. And it will cause us to live like we believe it. Are you awake? We need to know what to hope for. Once we've believed. We enter into this relationship through believing, but then the question that needs to be answered, and for so many people never truly is, is what am I supposed to anticipate? What am I supposed to be expecting? What am I supposed to set my attention on which will carry me across this field? And as we, we go, we have to see something toward the horizon, which keeps us moving. Is that coming through? Yeah. Now, in uh, 2 Timothy, in chapter 4, 2 Timothy represents for us probably the last letter that Paul wrote that we have, which is to say, we don't know precisely when his time on earth ended, but it was... As, this is the letter closest to it that we have. And he makes it clear here that he sees that coming and he's ready for it. He says at verse 6, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. He's not unaware that he's coming to the end of his time. He's sensing it. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. That's a great testimony, isn't it? Would you like to be able to say, when the time comes, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith? Having said that much, you can't make that, you can't expect to make that statement unless you've been led by the proper expectations through the process. This isn't something that we get straight in the last week of your life on your deathbed. 
This statement is available to those who are prepared to choose. A minute ago I was talking about being near the end of your life. And some of you are thinking, boy, that's a long way off for me. Decades and decades and decades and decades. That's hard to even picture or think about. And that's a good reason why I can just do whatever I please today. But that's not the, you don't get to, I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith by goofing off until you realize that it's really serious this time. This this is not the thing that we straighten out at the end. This is the thing that we work on every day. If I've fought a good fight, I've finished my course, I've kept the faith, is important to you, it's got to affect every day. But here's where he goes from there. He says in verse 8, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Now that's something to get excited about. That's something to anticipate. He calls it a crown of righteousness. There's other crowns mentioned in the New Testament. The crown of life is described both in Revelation chapter 2 and in James chapter 1. The crown of rejoicing is mentioned in 1 Thessalonians in chapter 2. The crown of glory is what Peter says you'll be given in 1 Peter chapter 5 and others. But he says the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. Now notice he calls the Lord the righteous judge. And there's just a hint, just a hint that Paul may have encountered some unrighteous judgments in his day. That some of the magistrates he has had dealings with have not been speaking for righteousness. And justice has not always been served. But he knows where he looks for true justice from. The righteous judge will be my vindication. Did you get that? The righteous judge will be my vindication. The only court where I know I'm going to get the right answer is heaven's court. And that's the place I'm not afraid to stand because of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the court I can go to without fear and trepidation, just awe and reverence. The righteous judge. Do you anticipate the righteous judge? Have you got an expectation that you're going to make an appearance before the righteous judge? It's going to affect some things, isn't it? But he says, and not to me only. I like that phrase, and not to me only. Because frankly, up till that point, you might have said to yourself, that Paul guy certainly seems to think a lot of himself. Because his statement is, there's a crown laid up for me. Woohoo! sort of sounds just a tad like I'm that much better than the rest of you, doesn't it? Just a tad. But he says, hey, 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 no, 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 not me only. All those who love his appearing. Everybody. This is a whosoever will opportunity. This isn't me, cool, the apostle Paul, you'd have to be me to get this. No, no, no. All those who love his appearing. All those who love his appearing. His appearing. It's the Greek word that we translate appearing is the word we get our English word epiphany from. Epiphaneia or something like that is how we're going to pronounce this in the Greek. It means a manifestation. It's derived from a word which means conspicuous or memorable, which is derived from a word which means literally to shine upon and therefore to become visible. Something having the light hit it so that you can see it. Jesus appears. He says, everybody who loves his appearing, everybody, now he's not talking about people that are fond of his appearing, think that would be neat. Hello? Did you notice how many Red Sox fans there were this fall? You see, I grew up with Red Sox fans because when I was growing up, Nobody alive could remember when they'd won anything. And when they went down hard in the 60s and the 70s, that hurt people. Are you guys still here? 
When you make it to the series and you don't win, that's hard. Now, stick with me a moment. You don't have to like baseball, but stick with me a moment. Those guys are Red Sox fans. Anybody can walk into a convenience store and buy a Boston cap today. Doesn't mean a thing. Did you believe it when it wasn't easy to believe? Did you live like it when it wasn't the popular thing to do? Half the Red Sox fans you meet are fond of the idea of winning, but they didn't live and die with these guys. They didn't listen to every game. My grandfather lay awake at night listening to a tiny transistor AM radio that he had on the headboard of his bed as Red Sox games were broadcast. He never saw them win. I mean, they won games, but he never saw them win a championship. But he listened, he listened, he listened. You know what I'm talking about? He wasn't just fond of the Red Sox. They mattered to him. Are you out here? Why am I saying all of that? Because there's an awful lot of people who are fond of the idea that Jesus is coming, but they don't actually live like it makes a big difference to them. It's not affecting anything we're doing today because it would be cool if, but let's not get too excited. Most of the time, it's just business as usual, and my favorite show's coming on pretty soon. And if we're going to love his appearing, we're going to be way beyond, I'm okay with his appearing, or it would be all right with me if he appeared, or I think I'm going to be all right if he appears. We're going to, this is where my commitment lies. This is what I've partnered with. This is where my hope is. This is what I'm anticipating. This is what I'm expecting. This is what I'm living like. This is who I am. Not somebody who's jumped on board because Jesus looks real popular all of a sudden, but somebody who has been with this thing all along. Are you hearing this? What we hope for affects us. It tells us where our anchor is, and the anchor holds us both in the storms and in the calms where the drifting happens. And then what we anticipate changes how we live changes what we do. Who we are shows up in what we do because of what we expect. And we have this great calling. Is this coming through? Let's stand up together, if you will. Now, I mentioned earlier that we make this entrance by faith. Many times we wonder, what would faith feel like? I'm, I can remember saying, I'm not sure that I know what I mean by believe. I've talked to many people who said, I'm not sure whether I'd know if I were believing or not. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. There's that moment where something gets our attention and something in us says, yes. And then we get a a dozen thoughts come to us which say, be cool, don't act strange, just let it go. It's not that big a deal. But that moment when we said yes is the one we have to respond to. I reflect, once in a while I mention the time that I was first told about Jesus and, and how that affected me. I mean, I knew of Jesus. I knew, I, I understood the tenets of faith in religions better than a lot of people who practiced them but I didn't understand what my relationship to Jesus was to be and what that meant. And I reflect on that moment when I suddenly knew who this Jesus was and what I had to do. And I think about what a proud and foolish guy I was. And it amazes me that I did it because it seems like exactly the sort of thing I would have hesitated on. I would have been afraid. I would have not done. I would have waited to see and to feel it through a little bit. And yet, somehow, I knew it was right and I did. 
And I don't know that that's a brilliant theological description, but it's been my experience that most of the time, just knowing in your knower and then doing is what this thing is about. And that in that moment when we know, we need to do something. And in the 10th chapter of the book of Romans, the ninth verse says, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. When I've been pricked in my knower and I know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that he died for me and that he's risen again and that that has to mean something. I'm not entirely sure what this concept of Savior is all about, but I know that I need one and he's it. You think, what should I do? The answer is there. I should confess Jesus Christ is Lord. I should believe in my heart that the Father has raised him from the dead. And I'd like to make that confession this morning because I do believe. And I'd like to invite you to join me. And if you've never made this confession, but you have that tugging in your heart, this is what that tugging is about. You can make this confession with me. Dear God, I thank you in the name of Jesus for hearing my cry. I do believe in my heart that you've raised Jesus from the dead. And I confess with my mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord. I thank you, Father, for this new life and this living hope that you've called me to. This fresh expectation. This fresh anticipation. Which is now mine. In Jesus Christ. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen.